uh, a month from today, I'll be starting my 16th year. So um, it's been a great pleasure to be here at the university. Actually, when I came, I started in forages in 2005 and I worked exclusively with forages, hay marketing, hay production, uh, growing forages, growing hay and that type of thing. Um, pretty much exclusively up until the about 2014, 2015. And then uh, I began to get involved with uh, industrial hemp, uh, worked with Dr. David Williams um, from 2015, 2016 up to 2019. Uh, and then I've been working with Dr. Pierce on that since. And, um, but I've still maintained uh, my background in forages and excited about the opportunity to be with you tonight. Um, I had the opportunity to visit with Philip a little bit before we got started this evening. And um, he's heard me do this presentation or several presentations, obviously, over the years. And as I was scrolling through my slides, he said I didn't have my go-to slide that I usually have with my hay presentations. And I, I told him I'd try to work it in. And I, as I sat here and thought about it, I thought, well, you know, why not just do it at the very beginning? And so um, I have to go back many moons ago, uh, many years even before coming to work at the university when I was a student here. Uh, and I was uh, doing my work study program uh, with Dr. A.J. Powell in the turf uh, department. and he was a great mentor. And during my work study, he said, Tom, you really need to take my uh, turf management class. And I said, Dr. Powell, I can't do that. That's a graduate level course. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm an undergraduate, so I, I can't take that course. He goes, Oh yeah, you can, you, you'll be fine. You don't worry about a thing. You just sign up to take the course. And I was very hesitant to do it. Uh, but he convinced me. And so First day of class, I, I was in room N12. For those of you that have been in school here in Ag North, you know the room I'm talking about. But I went into N12. I sat in the very front row. I sat in the middle, right in the front. Uh, back in that days, we didn't have iPads or cell phones or anything. We had a spiral bound notebook. And Dr. Powell came into the room and he addressed the class and he said, if you don't get anything out of this class, if you don't come to class, if you don't do well on the test, if you don't come to the labs, if you don't go to the farm or anything like that, he said, I want you to learn this one thing about turf. And I had my spiral bound notebook out and I got ready to write this great pearl of wisdom. And he turned around, he wrote on the blackboard, he wrote six words. He wrote, green is good, brown is bad. And I was never so disappointed in my whole life. But he went on to explain that if in the turf business, if you have a something green out there and it's mowed or manicured somewhat, rather than bare soil, um, you can maybe get away with it. So he said, if you don't, if you don't learn anything else in this turf class, remember that green is good and brown is bad. And so as I graduated from school and got involved in the hay business and hay industry and forages and that type of thing. I plagiarized that statement and I, I use that, I've used it in many, many, many talks uh, here in Kentucky and around the country. Uh, when it comes to hay and hay quality, if you don't remember anything I talk about tonight, I want you to remember those six words. And that is green is good, brown is bad. And in the hay business, if you've got a nice, really green bale of hay, it really doesn't matter the package. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. But if you've got nice leafy green hay and it smells good and it's soft to the touch, uh, you're probably gonna have a pretty good shot of selling that hay. But if you've got something that's brown, a hay that's brown, that means that it's been bleached by the sun, it's been rained on, it may have heated in the bale, um, some type of degradation has occurred to make that hay brown. So. When we're talking about marketing high quality hay, um, just again, remember those six words if you don't remember anything else from this evening's talk. Green is good, brown is bad. And so that kind of follows into this next slide. Um, when you leave here tonight, you start going forth, uh, you'll think, now what did that guy say from the UK about hay and so forth? Uh, here are some good websites that I go to on a regular basis. When I'm looking for information about making hay, selling hay, uh, 
do I have quality hay, that type of thing. Uh, the number one, the number one site there is the Forages website. Uh, we're going to go to that here in just a little bit. Uh, really good site to go to. Tons of information. We'll look at that a little bit later. Again, the next one is kyagr.com. That is the Kentucky Department of Agriculture's website. Uh, lots of information there on their hay testing program. Uh, foragetesting.org. Uh, this is one we'll allude to a little bit later on as well. Uh, this is the home of the National Forage Testing Association. So when you test that hay to see what the quality is, excellent website to uh, get the good information you need to pull a good sample, uh, the equipment you need to do that, the certified labs to send it to and Got so it. forth. Um, next we have eHay Weekly, Google Bye. eHay Weekly. I always talk about this and say that um, this is a little gift that I'll give you, it's free of charge. EHay Weekly is an electronic publication. It comes out every week, it comes out on Tuesday. And in it, there's always three good articles, three main articles. And um, one of those every week, I think would pertain to your operation if you're trying to make good quality hay. And so I would encourage you to, uh, to look at that, sign up for it, it doesn't cost you a penny. It comes into your mailbox every Tuesday. And one of the great things it has on there uh, on the lower right hand side is, and I want to try to go to this if we can a little bit later, uh, it has weekly hay prices on there. So when we talk about what's my hay worth, what will it bring, it's a really good place to go to. Uh, lastly, this is the website. Again, you can see it's a continuation of the upper one there uh, on our decision aids. And hopefully we're going to be able to go to that as well and look at a couple of different things on there. We have some excellent printed materials, uh, Southern Forages publication, uh, the Southern Forage Pocket Guide. If, you've not a, if you're not aware of those, if you haven't seen them, uh, talk to your county agent. They can get you a copy of that. It, there is a fee for that. Uh, don't expect your county agent to, to just give that to you, but they can give you the link to that. Really good materials to for good information on, on growing a good forages to put in that bale of hay. Here's the, um, the forage website I was talking to you about. And um, you can see on there, it's got uh, upcoming events, um, county agents, you can see there, publications, tons of good information on there. I, I, I copied this uh, last month in February, we're now in March. Uh, so this has been probably revamped since then. You'll see uh, links over here on the right-hand side for different, you know, alfalfa, hay and storage, the variety trials that go on with the forage program here. Again, you've probably already heard about these, but uh, I think it's worth uh, noting again, uh, tons of YouTube videos that Dr. Toich and Dr. Smith have put together, uh, just a plethora of information there that I think you'll find uh, very, very helpful uh, as you move forward. You know, hay, hay is big business. When we talk about hay, we're, we're not talking about just uh, something that's, that's not very big. Um, in the United States last year, we grew over 52 million acres of hay. And that ranks, on, that ranks third behind corn and soybeans. So um, uh, hay is big business and, and it means a lot of money. You know, that hay was valued at somewhere over $18 billion. And so uh, it can mean a lot of money. There's a lot of people. If you go to groups like the National Hay Association, uh, you'll see a lot of people that have made a lot of money in the hay business, and um, it, it can be very big business. In Kentucky, obviously not quite as many acres, uh, but we did have a little over 2 million acres of hay harvested last year uh, here in the state of Kentucky. Hay, hay sales go everywhere. Uh, hay is sold locally in your county, uh, down your road with your neighbor. Uh, it's sold statewide. Hay moves, you know, from county to county or from Western Kentucky to Eastern Kentucky or Central Kentucky. Uh, it moves nationally and there's a tremendous amount of hay that, that goes overseas as export. So I think a lot of times we get kind of sidetracked thinking, well, I'm a hay producer, you know, I might be able to sell a little bit of my hay here and in Fayette County or, or Lewis County or wherever the case might be, but in actuality, done correctly, and you put up a quality product, uh, you can sell it about anywhere. Now, logistics will play a role in 
how far you can maybe go with that, but good quality hay uh, can be sold about anywhere. Uh, as I mentioned, um, you know, we, we get hay in from other states. Uh, we import hay into Kentucky. Uh, we import hay from states as far away as Washington and New York, Nevada, and so forth. And then we ship hay, we export hay to other states, primarily to the Southeast. Uh, but our hay can go in any direction. Uh, we're very fortunate here in Kentucky that we have a great interstate highway system that can get us uh, to lots of places in a short amount of time. So uh, we're very fortunate in that regards here in Kentucky. If you're in the hay business, you basically have two options. Uh, you're gonna make that hay, you have to market it. You're either gonna market it as cash hay, again, selling it to your neighbor or to a horse farm or to a dairy or a feedlot operation. Uh, or you're going to sell it through your own livestock enterprise. Really, basically, only two options you have. And you are a hay salesperson. I mean, you may be selling it to yourself, uh, but you're a hay salesperson. And uh, I tell you that, uh, we'll get to that here in just a moment. But um, as I mentioned, I started at the university in 2005. Uh, prior to that, I spent 16 years traveling around the country. Uh, looking at hay producing farms, hay producing operations from Florida to Washington State, from New York to Southern California, and everywhere in between. And a lot of times when I come back to Kentucky, or I talk about Kentucky hay, I would always hear the statement, well, we can't produce as good a hay in Kentucky as they can produce in Kansas or Nebraska or New York or Idaho or Montana or whatever. And that's just bunk. I mean, we can produce the forage. Our soils, our climate are conducive to where we can produce as good a quality, as high as quality of hay as we can produce anywhere in the country. And don't let anyone ever tell you different because it's just not true. We have the ability to make very, very high quality hay. Now we have some hurdles to overcome. We have humidity, we have uh, hot, dry June or July and August. Uh, we have rainstorms. Uh, we have a lot of things we have to overcome, uh, but don't let anyone ever say that we can't grow as good a hay or make as good a hay in Kentucky uh, as they can anywhere, because I will uh, refute that all day long. Now, I mentioned a couple of slides ago that you are a hay salesman and or salesperson. And in order to sell something, you have to know what it costs. And so one of the tools that we have is our forage decision aid that I mentioned. And so I'm going to, Philip, you're going to have to kind of work with me here to see if we can uh, make this work. I'm going to do a new share. See if I can do that here. And uh, that didn't work. Bear with me. All right, Philip, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this or not. Um, okay. oh, oh, are you, there we go. You got it? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I went to the website. I went to the Forge Enterprise Budgets. You can see them here. And Philip, tell me if you can, if I stop sharing or something there, okay? So we're going to go up here and we're going to click Enable Editing. We're going to Enable Content. Well, well sorry, Tom. Uh, the only thing I see right now is the website that says Forage Decision Aid Information, and then you quit sharing. It's kind of locked on that screen. Is that any better? Mm, I seen where you clicked on the link, but it didn't go to the link. Tom, you may have to go to the window that opened and share that. Okay, let's see. If we can do this, if I now I got it. All right, does that work? You that see me scrolling up and down? Yes, All sir. Right. So you can see the tabs there at the very bottom. You'll see those same tabs: um, alfalfa hay, grass mixed hay, and so forth. So I'm going to click on the alfalfa hay tab. Did that come up, Philip? Yes, sir. 
All right. So I just want to show the folks tonight that these are very user friendly. And again, if you're selling something, whether it's to yourself or you're selling it for cash, a, you can't sell it if you don't know what it costs you. And that's one of our problems that we've had is, is not really knowing what our input costs are when we're trying to sell high quality hay. And so uh, all these numbers that you see here are very interactive. You can change them. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna do a very few, just so the folks get an idea of, of what it entails to do this. And then I encourage them to just work with this for their operation. So it says up here, it says total acres in enterprise, it says 100 acres. So I'm gonna click on that and I'm gonna change that to 100, okay? And then when I go down here and click, you're gonna see all these numbers change automatically. Or hopefully you will, if we have done this right. Did that work, Philip? Yes, sir. Our numbers changed. Okay, good. Very good. So we're not going to do 175 bales per acre. You all are all good producers. You're going to do 200 bales per acre. Okay. And we're going to change. We're going to click down there again. You can see those numbers changed again. And then we're going to do 50 pound bales. Okay. Because those are pretty easy to do some calculations on and so forth. So we're going to change that. We're going to click on that. And so that gives us five tons per acre, okay? And that gives us a total revenue for 100 acres of $62,500. Well, I think our hay, I think your hay is worth more than $125 a ton, especially if it's high quality alfalfa. So I'm gonna make that $200 a ton, okay? So we're, we're seeing 62,000 there right now. And when I change that to, $200 a ton, now that goes to $100,000, okay? So again, very easy to input those numbers. You can do your whole farm, you can do one field, you can do two fields, uh, but the bottom line is you can get a real idea about whether you're gonna make money or lose money in this hay operation that you got. Below that, you see our variable cost. You see seed, if we're gonna seed every five years, if we've got alfalfa, we're not putting any nitrogen on because it's going to fix that from the atmosphere. Phosphorus and potassium, we, we use a lot of those elements when we take that hay off the ground. Those do need to be replaced every year. Uh, lime, we're going to need to replace that to keep our pH up. But the bottom line is, is we can change any of those numbers. If we don't, if we want to go to 150 pounds of potassium, we, all we have to do is click on that, change that to 150 pounds. Again, that changes all of our numbers automatically. Uh, you can go down here that you can see that we look at those numbers. Again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. I just want to try to go through this with you real quickly. Um, you can see that uh, above our variable cost, we have a return of $64,235. So that's hundred acres. So we divide that by hundred. That, that gives us a return above variable cost of $642 and 35 cents uh, above our variable cost. Then we go down to our uh, some of our fixed cost, and you can see that um, we get a return of 52,235, and that's with our fixed and variable cost fixed in, divide that by 100, and you can see that, um, you know, for those 100, for the per acre, we're getting $522.35, so, if corn is $8 a bushel, that might not look so good. If soybeans are $17 or $18 a bushel, that might not look too good. But if corn is $3.50 a bushel and beans are $8 a bushel, where, you know, what might we be looking at? So anyway, I just wanted to go through that with you. Uh, appreciate you uh, letting me take time to do that. Again, I think it's something you can do very easily. Do it on a rainy day. Do it, you know, having a cup of coffee at breakfast one morning or something like that, um, but it really gives you a good idea about what your, um, what your costs are and what you can sell that hay for and make a profit. All right, let's see if we can go back to this new share here, Philip. All okay, right. yep, we're back. We're back? Okay, mm -hmm. there we go. Good, we're right on track. That went better than I thought it might. <laughs> okay. So we want to make quality hay. We're going to try to market quality hay. We need quality hay. 
the number one thing that affects quality more than anything when we cut hay is the stage of growth. That's the number one thing that affects quality. And this is a very old slide here. This was done by Dr. Roy Blazer at Virginia Tech many moons ago, even before I was in school. So I'll tell you how old it is. But you can see on the bottom axis, on the X axis, we've got grasses and legumes. And then you can see we have the leafy stage, the boot or the free bud, heading and bloom. And you can see that that's time. As time goes on and our plants start to green up here this month, you know, now that we're through February, days are getting very long now or getting longer, you know, those grasses and legumes are going to start to emerge. We're going to see tillering. We're going to see shoots and it's going to start to grow. And so as that plant grows, you can see we get elongation. Uh, you can see here we get uh, the heading and the bud stage right here. And then if we let that go to full maturity, we get a seed head and a flower uh, on our legume. And you can see that what that does is uh, we follow this line here. You see that our yield continually goes up, 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 and up. All right. And that makes perfect sense. But we have an inverse relationship with quality because our digestibility and our intake <clears throat> go down as that plant matures. And so if we go over here where we get the highest yield, look at where our, our digestibility and intake is. It, it's way down, way down. Now, if we could cut over here on the left, on this first picture of the growth here, man, we'd get some really high intake. We'd get some fantastic digestibility. Well, we wouldn't get anything off the field, would we? We'd just be wasting our time. We'd run, be running around trying to bail up a little bit of nothing. But if we go over here to the far right, we wait till it's very mature, we're gonna get a lot of volume and our quality is gonna be poor, poor, poor. So where do we want to cut? In Kentucky, Central Kentucky, Northern Kentucky, Western Kentucky. Where do we want? Where's the ideal time, to, especially for that first cutting? We want to hit, try to hit right in here, where these two lines intersect. Okay, that's our optimum time to cut. Now you say, well, when when does that occur, Tom? Well, primarily in Kentucky, pretty much from east to west, you're looking at early May. Uh, Western Kentucky, you might be looking at that last few days of April. Uh, you get to up in the Maysville area, uh, Northern Kentucky, you might be looking at the 5th or 6th or even the 10th of May. <clears throat> but those first 10 days of May is when we need to be targeting that, that first cutting. That's where we're going to get our most yield. And if we do it right, we, we should get some really good quality. And you say, well, Tom, hey, that, that's great. I mean, I can, I can set up to do that. But guess what happens in the first part of May? We get a rain shower by it every two or three days. And that is true. Uh, but typically between the 1st and the 15th or the 15th or the 20th of May, we'll have a decent window of weather to try to get some hay made. Uh, some years we get really good, other years we don't. But we, that's the target date that we need to be shooting for. Uh, we're, we don't have time to talk about some of the things we could do to minimize that, but uh, that's the target date we need to be shooting for uh, to get that hay made. Um, so when we get the hay made, we, we got it cut at the right time. We got it in a good bale. We got it dry. What are some of the quality indicators we need to be looking at to know if our, qual our hay is really high quality? And that is, you know, here are some of the things you're going to see when you get that test back. You're going to see TDN, total digestible nutrients. You're going to see, <clears throat> excuse me, crude protein, ADF, NDF, NDFD, relative feed value, <clears throat> relative forage quality. <clears throat> All those are good indicators of forage quality, okay? And depending upon who you talk to, whether you talk to your veterinarian, whether you talk to your feed store, whether you talk to a nutritionist, or whomever you talk to, all of them are probably going to use one or two or a myriad of these different ones, and they're going to use them in different priorities, okay? So it kind of depends on who you're working with as to which one of these or which group of these they put the most emphasis on, all right? And that's okay. That's good because they all have their importance. However, the best indicator of quality is always going to be animal performance, okay? 
How much milk did that hay put in the tank? How many pounds of gain did it put on that animal, that beef steer, okay? Uh, did that cow keep good body conditioning uh, when we were feeding that hay? Thoroughbreds, uh, horses are a little different. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that as we move forward, but these are good indicators. This is the best indicator, okay? So when you're trying to sell your hay, your quality hay, when you talk to your customer, that's what you're gonna to wanna to know and that's what they wanna know. And you're gonna form a relationship based on that. So here, I've got just a couple of charts here I wanna go over with you. I won't spend a lot of time on this, but these are some charts that our animal science people came up with. Uh, you look up here, you'll see a thousand pound beef cow, and then you'll see percent TDN here at the bottom. Uh, on the lower graph, you'll see crude protein. Okay, you're gonna see the second trimester. This is the stage of production over on the left. And what this animal's needs are as we move through second trimester, third trimester, after the birth of that calf giving average milk <clears throat> or a two-year-old, you know, still trying to grow and give milk, or if you've got a mature cow that just gives a lot of milk. So I'm not gonna to touch on these right here. We're gonna move forward with one more. <clears throat> this is for a 500 pound medium frame steer. Again, the same thing, we're looking at TDN, crude protein, and then what our average de desired daily gain is. Okay, so this gives you a tool to work with. Uh, again, when you're talking to those people that are gonna buy your hay or whether you're feeding your hay to your own livestock. Now, I need to move my thing here. Um, let's do this, there we go. Um, so this is a test that Dr. Henning got me um, and just wanna go over some of the things. I've circled some of the numbers here that we need to be paying attention to. This was done last fall in September. This was a mixed grass hay. Uh, you can see the moisture. This is something I always try to look at. Uh, and then we can see over here on a dry weight basis or dry matter basis, excuse me, we have crude protein and then we have TDN. Again, two of those parameters we were talking about a little bit earlier. Now you can see up here, I've got these charts that we had in the, the previous slide there. And you can see that in that second trimester, the TDN requirements for that cow are about 48% TDN. And if we go down to crude protein, we see that uh, crude protein, she needs about 7% crude protein in that second trimester. So if we're feeding that cow and we've got this hay and we're gonna feed her, we've got 7.88% crude protein. Does that meet that cow's crude protein requirement needs? Absolutely, it does. What about TDN, all right? TDN is 48, 47, 48. We're at 50% TDN. Is that hay going to meet that TDN requirement of that cow? Absolutely. Okay. So if we're feeding that cow any corn or soybean meal, we're just wasting our money. Okay. Um, but let's look, let's look after she has that calf and she's given a lot of milk, what her needs are at that point in time. If we go to TDN, we're out here at about 67%. And if we go down to crude protein, we're 12%. TDN, 50.95 here on our test. Up here, we've got 67. Are we meeting that cow's TDN requirements? Not even close. She needs energy to keep making that milk, keep body condition and breed back. What about crude protein? We need 12% crude protein. What have we got here? 7.88, woefully lacking on crude protein. We need to be getting some soybean meal or some type of protein supplement in her to get that uh, protein up to where she needs it. So this, this hay fits the bill for one animal, one class of animal, but it does not come close in that second class of animal that's giving that heavy milk. Let's move to another hay. All right. I'm a... Okay, so this is another uh, hay analysis that Dr. Henning got for me. Uh, you can see again, the moisture. Uh, I circled that, it's a, I would be a little bit concerned. You can see up here, it says it was a little damp. Um, I'd have to look into that a little bit deeper, but for tonight's purposes, we're gonna go with what we've got. We've got 18% crude protein, 62% TDN. So 
we went through this with that, with that other, we won't go through the whole thing, but we're gonna look at the heavy milking cow. Uh, crude protein is 67%. We're at 62%. So we're a little bit short on energy here. Not too awful bad. Certainly not like that last day was. Um, and then for crude protein, 12%. You can see we're at 18.6. So we more than, more than meet the need for that crude protein. So if we're feeding any protein supplement to this animal, we're, we're wasting money. Uh, she does probably need some corn or some type of energy. Uh, to get that TDN up, again, to give as much milk as she can to breed back and to keep a good body condition score. So these are ways that you know if you've got a quality hay and you can work with your customer uh, if you're selling hay. Uh, these are some of the tools that you have available to market that quality hay at the highest possible level. I want to talk a little bit about packaging. Packaging is very, very important. When I was growing up on the farm and was first involved in the hay business over here on the right, third picture down, small square bales is all we had. Nowadays, um, there are any number of uh, ways to package your hay. I'm not gonna mention all these, but you, you see pictures of some of them. Round bales certainly took over in our country after the small square bales. We have baleage. You're gonna have a presentation about making good baleage. I know uh, here later, uh, we've got big size packages, four by four by eights uh, that are moved around. We've got cubes, we've got loaves, we've got compressed hay that's shipped overseas. This was some hay in Japan that was shipped out of Washington. So uh, I just show you this to think, you know, there are many options out there. And so if your farmer next to you wants round bales and that's where your market's going to be, then that's what you're going to want to focus on. <clears throat> if you're going to try to go to the horse market, Small squares might be the, the, the hay that you want. Although more and more horse operations are using the bigger bales nowadays. Um, feed lots out in the West, they grind their hay. So they might take big bales, they might take round bales. It just depends. So, but when you're thinking about marketing your hay, especially to someone other than yourself, uh, think about what your customer or the potential customer for the market you want to capture, what is the size package they want or size of packages they want. They might want more than one different size of package, okay? So if you're gonna feed hay to your own livestock market, again, you're gonna sell it to your, your own livestock, your cattle, your horses, llamas, goats, sheep, whatever. You wanna treat it as a separate enterprise. You want to do those budget things we looked at a little bit earlier. Uh, you wanna match that hay to the class of livestock. We went through those examples of where that hay meets the needs of that animal and where it doesn't meet the need of that animal. The only way you can do that is to have that hay tested. Uh, we'll talk more about that moving forward. But again, you're actually marketing that hay to yourself. Let's touch on the cash hay market a little bit. Cash hay is a different beast, um, but again, it's driven by supply and demand, just like corn and soybeans and other ag commodity crops. Where can I find out what my hay is worth, okay? Um, you can look at hay auctions or auctions online. There are local auctions, hay auctions here in Kentucky, in different locations. Sometimes uh, you see ads in the paper for hay being sold and that kind of thing. Uh, word of mouth, if you're having a cup of coffee at the corner diner and your neighbor comes in, you say, hey, are you selling some hay? What's it worth, you know? Uh, what, what can I sell my hay for? And of course, the internet, just beware. A lot of things you find on the internet, I know you find this hard to believe, might not be true. So, Phil, I'm going to try to go to another screen here real quick. And let's see if we can make this work. I don't know. Um, did my email come up there? Yes, sir. You see me I see scrolling e down? Hey, weekly. Yeah. E hey, weekly. That's right. So, you see me scrolling down? Yes, sir. Okay. All right, so good. So here, I want to go down here to hay markets, hay for sale. I'm going to click on this USDA weekly hay price, and hopefully you're going to follow with me. Did it come up? Not yet. Okay. So maybe I'm going to have to go and try to share that. Let's see.
Now Hello? I did. Yes, sir. Okay. So you see me scrolling? Yes, sir. All right. So again, this is this is a good place for farmers to go to to try to find out what hay is really bringing uh, on the market right now. So you can see up here, it says alfalfa hay prices. You can see California, Colorado, Idaho, Kansas, uh, all these states. Sometimes Kentucky's on there. Uh, when we get numbers reported from Kentucky, they will show up on here. Uh, you can see that good premium hay in Idaho is $170 a ton. That's at the farm, okay? Uh, in Iowa, you can see good premium quality alfalfa, $180 to $325 a ton. That says that D means delivered. Now that's not delivered anywhere. That they'll have a range that they'll deliver that for that price. Again, California and so forth. So we see the low on here is about $170 a ton, all the way up to looks like 325 is about the highest. Again, that's delivered. So when I put that $200 a ton in earlier for good quality alfalfa hay made here in Kentucky. Um, I was trying to be pretty kind of in the middle of the road there. Um, again, I think we can do that. If you look at Nebraska, uh, Missouri, those are states that are somewhat closer to us, Kansas, Iowa. Uh, so again, just a good barometer, I think, for farmers to look at when they're trying to figure out what they can sell their hay to uh, or who they can sell their hay to. Again, you can see grass hay prices. You can see a whole lot of difference here. Um, you can see, I want you to look down here in Pennsylvania, 265 to 350 for premium grass hay. Now, how can that be, you say? You look at Missouri, 120, Minnesota, 70, uh, 100 up here in Alabama. So again, different states, different pricing. Um, but that Pennsylvania hay is probably some of it going overseas. It's going to the horse market and the racetracks in New York City probably some Amish dairies, and it's probably being sold by the bale and, and being recalculated that way. These are all per ton prices, by the way, okay? So again, just a way for you to um, get some pricing information when you think about that hay and what you can sell it for uh, moving forward. All right, let's go back and see if we can just get back to our screen. Get us back. Yes, sir. We are back to the PowerPoint. Wow. That's amazing. Glad we can make that work. All right. Let's see if we can get to another slide. All right. What are some of the different cash hay markets that we have available? I mentioned some of those just a little bit earlier. We'll touch on these just briefly. Uh, dairy market, uh, large market. Uh, dairy cows uh, eat a lot. They consume a lot of feed. Uh, when hay gets too high, dairy... Uh, dairy producers will move away from it. They'll find some other source of protein or energy that they need. Uh, but there is a lot of hay that goes to the dairy industry. They like large packages. They do TMRs and they don't want to fool with small square bales. Uh, you might get by selling some round bales to them for some sick animals or something like that, uh, but they want large packages. Um, you can't go too awful far with it. You can move dairy hay. Uh, if you get a good freight rate, they absolutely positively will demand you have a quality test done on that hay. They're going to look at the parameters we looked at, the crude protein, the TDN, <clears throat> but they're going to look at many more factors, okay? I might look at relative forage quality, relative feed value. We didn't touch on those too much, but they're going to have a, they're going to have a ration. They're going to have a nutritionist, and that hay is going to have to fit the bill to fit into that ration. The good thing is, though, if you're selling them a really good product, they're going to have a way to measure that performance. If you're selling a load of dairy hay to a dairy farmer here in Kentucky, and you say, hey, look, you're buying hay from Iowa or Indiana or Illinois or New York, wherever the case might be, and you're paying $180 a ton for that hay, uh, I want to sell you some hay, but I need $200 a ton for that hay. They'll say, well, I'm getting hay $20 cheaper a ton. Why would I buy it from you? You say, look, buy one load from me and then look at the, look at the milk in the tank. And if there's not more milk in the tank, then I wouldn't blame you to go back and buy that cheaper hay. But if there's more milk in the tank and the numbers pencil out, I'd really like you to buy my hay. And at that point in time, 
you, you've made a sale if in fact that that tank milk tank volume goes up. So there is a way to measure performance and, and there's not always that case. Dairy, again, primarily alfalfa because that's where we get the most bang for our buck. Uh, they will use, depending upon the one, whoever balancing the ration, they might want an alfalfa grass mix. They could use something like a brome grass or a prairie hay for some dry cows or sick cows or something like that. So uh, not a lot of options, but a few when it comes to dairy hay. Horse market, again, a large market, very large market. You are selling the person primarily. Now that, that has begun to change some uh, as we get more sophisticated, as we have the internet, we have better testing and those kind of things. Uh, more people are requiring a test on the horse market, but my belief is you're still selling that person and you're selling them on sensory perception. How does it look? How does it feel? How does it smell? Um, and if it fills all the bills, remember when I first started out with green is good, brown is bad. Well, if you've got a nice leafy green hay that's alfalfa or alfalfa grass mix, you're going to have a pretty good shot of selling that hay, especially if you're price competitive. It absolutely must be clean of any foreign material, no must, no, I mean, excuse me, no mold, no dust, no weeds, anything like that. Uh, it's gotta be clean hay. These are high value animals. Uh, in some cases, if you're, if you're going to the thoroughbred market, uh, you could be anywhere from a thousand dollar animal up to a million dollar animal. And you don't wanna be feeding those kind of animals and have issues with animals getting sick or colicking or something like that. There's really no way to know if you're getting bang for your buck, like we talked about on the dairy market, because when we're feeding mares and foals and or stallions, we, a lot of times we don't want to put weight on them. We want to keep body condition, but we don't want them to gain weight. If we've got foals that we're feeding, we don't want them to grow too fast. We want bone development and muscle development to keep up with one another. We don't want to get them out of balance again. So, but, we're not always looking for maximum production. So we really don't have a way to measure performance like we do in the dairy industry. So uh, that's important to keep in mind too on the horse market. Lots of different types of hays you can sell to the horse industry. Uh, depending upon where horses are, are uh, at, you know, if they're in the South, they get a lot of Bermuda grass. But if they're up North, they're gonna get Timothy and brome grass. Uh, but if you, if you wanna sell hay to the horse market, just as a rule of thumb, you shoot for an alfalfa grass mix of about 50-50 and you get that made right and you get it good and green and soft and everything, you'll be able to sell it. Um, you just will. But again, lots of different hays fill the bill for the horse market. Beef market, again, it's a very large market. Uh, not a lot of play in that. Uh, you can't ship it very far. Um, Usually you're feeding your own livestock when you're feeding in the beef market. There are feedlots that buy hay uh, and just about anything goes. Again, it's gonna be in a TMR. Uh, I've seen the kind of hay on the left there, the leafy green, knock your eyes out, beautiful hay, go to a feedlot. And I've seen the kind of hay on the right that's just old round bells that have sat outside for a year or two and aren't worth hardly anything other than being filler. Uh, both of those, you know, have been and can be utilized, again, if, if the price is right. There are other markets out there that you can uh, market quality hay to, small ruminants uh, here in Kentucky, uh, goats, uh, sheep, that kind of thing, uh, certainly are, are avenues to market hay. Uh, we used to send hay to zoos, to different types of nurseries, feed stores, uh, some types of hay, especially alfalfa, goes into medical research, uh, energy crops, uh, lots of work for renewable energy now, you know, hays can be used for that. And then, <clears throat> excuse me, in some cases, if we have some hay, it doesn't get upright, it's not worth feeding, we can actually use that for mulch in some cases, uh, for water erosion, we can actually put standing bales to deter water movement and those kind of things. And that type of hay does sell. It obviously doesn't bring much money, uh, but it is a market that, uh, that might be available to you. Transportation, again, very important. Uh, depending upon your customer, 
Uh, you might have the highest quality hay in the world, but if you can't get it to their operation in the package they want and in a vehicle they can handle, whether it might be a straight truck, it might be a tractor trailer, it might just be a pickup, it might be a wagon, um, but it has to fit the need of that customer that you're selling it to. Uh, of course, we obviously work with a lot of uh, tractor trailers, a lot of hay moves on rail from the Northwest down into the Southeast into Florida to the hay markets down there. And then obviously if you're gonna export hay overseas, uh, you have to get into shipping on ocean liners and that type of thing, which, um, can be a real headache, but it can also mean profit sometimes. I mentioned this very early on about forage testing. Again, the only way you're gonna know if you have a quality product is if you test it. If you test every lot of hay, you test the first cutting, the second cutting, the third cutting, the fourth cutting. You test field A on the first cutting, field B on the first cutting, field C on the first cutting, the creek field, the barn field, the back field, the creek field, um, all those need to be sampled. And this website is going to help you do the very best job possible to get the very best test you can get. And um, it's going to tell you how to do it on the sampling technique. It's going to talk to you about that sampling terminology with all those indicators that I talked about a little bit earlier. It's going to have a list of moisture probes that you can, excuse me, it's going to have sampling equipment that you can get for sampling. They also have moisture probes on there. Um, you can get a sampling certificate if you want that. Uh, most of you probably wouldn't be interested in that, but probably here at the bottom is the thing you're probably going to be interested in the most, and that's the list of certified labs. So when you get that sample, you want to send it to a laboratory that you uh, know has a good reputation for submitting good results, so that when you send that hay that you tested to a dairy and they retest it, uh, your analysis are going to be hopefully very close. They will not be the same, uh, but you want to use a certified lab and you certainly want to uh, maintain that they use a certified lab. So uh, that is just very, very critical when it comes to selling high quality hay is testing that hay and know exactly what you're testing. I'm going to end with this slide right here. Um, this is an old slide. You can see it was back in the 90s, but its premise is as true today as it was back then. And that is if you look on the bottom axis, you're going to see relative forage value and it's forage quality, but at that time it was re relative feed value. You can see we started out at 75, which might be a, a grass hay. And you see we get up to above 150 relative feed value. And basically what it says is that as you go up in quality, as you go up in feed value and feed quality, that price of that hay goes up, okay? And I don't have any new data on that, but I know that it's true. <clears throat> the higher the quality, the higher the price that it's gonna command. And I want you to think back to that budget, those budget numbers we looked at when we went through that spreadsheet and we changed the numbers and the pricing and the tons and those inputs. Um, those kind of numbers, the quality numbers you get from that hay test are gonna help you know that where your hay is going to be and how you're going to be able to, to price that hay. If you've got a relative feed value of over 150, uh, you're going to get a pretty good darn good price for that hay. If you've got a grass hay and it's say somewhere between 75 and 80 or 85 RFV, then you need to be expecting to take a lot less for that hay. And that's okay uh, if it meets those numbers and you can sell it for $80 a ton and you only have $70 a ton, then that might work for you. But again, I just wanted to end with this to basically drive home the point uh, that the higher the quality, the higher the price you can expect. And again, as, as I started out, and I hope uh, for some of you that didn't, weren't here at the very beginning, I uh, started out with the, with the phrase, green is good, brown is bad. And so that's what I'm gonna end with tonight, Philip. And uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that anybody might have um, moving forward. Well, thank you, Tom. Uh, let me get here to the chat box here. If you all have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. The price per ton in various states data, what was the tonnage in? Small squares, large squares, round, et cetera. 
all the above, all the above, and there may have been some round. I mean, when I look at states like Iowa and Alabama, and I'm looking at grass hay, then I'm probably thinking round bale. When I'm looking at Idaho, Washington, uh, Oregon, California, I'm looking at either large three string bales for the horse industry or three by four by eight large bales or maybe even four by four by eight large bales. So it kind of depends on the location. They don't differentiate there, Philip. Um, and you have to kind of uh, go with where it is in the country that's reporting it. You know, east of the Mississippi, uh, unless you're talking about New York, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois, something like that, you're probably looking at round bales, especially in the southeast, except maybe when you get to Florida. And so, um, you know, that that's kind of, um, you just kind of have to surmise that, if you will. Uh, again, anyone's, anytime anybody's got any questions, they're more than welcome to give me a call and or send me an email or something, be happy to work with them if they have any questions or anything like that. All right, number two. Oh, we're getting a bunch of them in. Hang on, sorry, it's moving on me. On the price website, how much, how, or sorry, on the price website, how do they determine what premium good, et cetera, is? So that would go back to the USDA grades. I did not show those. Um, but again, if that premium is going to be uh, 150 to 180 relative feed value plus, it's going to be 20% crude protein or above. Um, you know, on the grass haze, the premium quality is probably going to be up around that 80 to 90, 80 to 90 RFV. And, um, but, but you can go, there are other places where you can dig deeper into that. If, if you um, go into there, there's a link that you can go and dig into those numbers a lot deeper. They're just, that's just a screenshot or a screen capture, if you will, of, of what they're showing averaging nationally, but there's a, a lot better breakdown if you look at, if you go and if you Google USDA AMS hay prices, uh, you'll be able to find it by different states. Now, not all states report hay prices, but if you go in to look at USDA, um, uh, the uh, marketing service, Ag Marketing Service, AMS, hay prices, they'll break that down for you uh, for all the states that are reporting. Um, and, and they'll tell you what those relative feed values are and, and how that quality breaks down. But the premium stuff is, is high octane stuff, no doubt. Okay, next question. What should the moisture be when pricing hay by the ton? I, that's one of the things that I always look at on a test. That's a great question. Um, you know, everybody's concerned about crude protein, TDN, all those kind of things, relative feed quality and those kind of things. Moisture is one of the first things I look at because if that moisture is above, say, 13 to 15% moisture, then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, is there some spoilage in that hay? Did that hay maybe heat a little bit or something like that? Uh, I want to see my hay moisture somewhere down around 8, 10, 11, 12%. When I see that, I feel really good that that's a good dry hay. Uh, that's going to store, whether it's on, whether it's the guy I'm buying it from, or if I'm trying to sell it, I want good dry hay that I know is going to ship. And then when it gets to the customer, they're not going to have any complaints about mold or mildew or anything like that. Okay. Next question. NFTA indicates testing methods as either wet or NIR. What are these? Okay. Great question. So those are the, the way the analysis are done on the sample that you sent in. It's either a wet chemistry analysis that they do, or it's an NIR, near infrared spectroscopy analysis they do. Um, and a lab can be certified in one or the other, or they can be certified in both. Um, I'm very comfortable with an NIRS analysis. Uh, if the lab is proficient and certified. Uh, a wet chemistry tends to give you more reliable results. 
But if they're reporting NIRS analysis to NFTA and they're a certified lab, I'm okay with either one of those tests, whether they do it wet chemistry or whether they do it in IRS. If you do wet chemistry, it's usually a little bit higher charge uh, because they have to use a lot of chemicals and it takes more time and that type of thing. In IRS, you just take the sample, put it in the machine, and it spits out the analysis uh, rather quickly. So I'm okay with either one as long as it's from a certified lab. Okay. Do you recommend cutting hay twice during the summer, or is it more beneficial to try to get three cuts? I know weather is the main factor, especially in Kentucky. Well, right. Weather is, is a big factor. There's no doubt. Uh, my first goal would be to try to make that first cutting hay as well as I possibly could. Uh, try to get that and get that in the barn. Um, and then... I'm going to want to uh, let that recover. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna wanna look at my soil test results to see if I need to put say maybe some potassium back on there, especially if I'm doing alfalfa. Um, if I get good growth and the temperatures stay cool, we don't have a blazing hot summer and we continue to get moisture and I can get another cutting off of there, then I'm gonna wanna do that. Uh, you know, There's no reason we can't get two or three gr good grass cuttings if I've got alfalfa, I'm shooting for a minimum of at least four cuttings uh, every 32 to 35 days. Again, I'm gonna take that first cutting uh, the first part of May, and then I'm gonna get one uh, early to mid June. I'm gonna get mid July to late July. I'm gonna get September, uh, maybe even early October, mid October. So I'm gonna to try to make, hopefully if everything goes good, I've got good fertility under there. If I'm doing grass hay, I'm getting some nitrogen on there. I'm going to try to get a good two or three cuttings. But if I've got alfalfa, I'm going to be really shooting for four. And on the odd chance, you know, there might be some time I could even get five. But um, I'm going to shoot for four on the alfalfa, three on the hay. But again, it goes back to that soil test. Every cutting of hay that we take off that field, no matter what we're taking off, we're taking off lots of pounds of N, P, and K, and we've got to replace that if we're going to get additional cuttings during the year. Okay, and I'm pretty sure you've got the next question here. Um, if you get the first cutting of hay off in May, like you spoke about the ideal times for the second and third cutting, you, you, you hit that topic. Uh, you did mention cutting hay in September, November, what's that? Isn't there an unwritten rule about cutting hay or alfalfa, especially after September 15th, when we wait till frost? Yeah, it, it depends uh, again on the year. Um, but you can get that fourth cutting before the 15th of September. If, every, if everything goes good, you've got the fertility under it, you get the moisture. Yeah, we don't want to cut, um, we want to let those root reserves build up. So Depending on who you talk to, someone will say September 15th, uh, others will say uh, October 1st. Uh, again, it just depends on the maturity of that plant. But we would like a full mature plant when that uh, killing frost comes on there uh, so that we've built up those carbohydrates and energy into that root system so that next month in April, we're going to start getting a good flush of growth and we're going to have a dynamite first cutting come this year. Sounds great. Uh, guys, you, if you have any more questions, put them in the chat. I am going to put a shameless plug in for our Eastern Kentucky Hay Contest. As far as I know, we are on track to do it again in 2021. Uh, if you want a free hay sample, and you don't have to participate in the contest, but uh, there's different categories uh, as far as alfalfa, alfalfa for grass, grass hay, haylage, uh, and it's a nice little competition and it, like I said, you get a free hay sample out of the year. So starting in the late summer, feel free to contact your county agent and uh, they will be more than happy to come out and pull a hay sample for Phillip, you. Philip, that, that, uh, that is a great yes, contest. Sir. That is one of the best contests in the whole country. Um, it's probably the largest that I'm aware of where farmers are actually afforded the opportunity to get their hay tested at no charge and get an analysis back. Uh, a lot of 
a lot, I know a lot of these states that have these state contests, they'll get in 200 samples or 300. Maybe I've heard of some states maybe getting close to four, but I think would, did y'all have like 600 last year or something? Yeah, we were right yeah, at 600. Yeah, yeah. So that's a great, that's a great tool for Kentucky farmers. Uh, well, Eastern Kentucky farmers and, um, really encourage folks to do that. I, I think that's a great, great program. Yeah, I agree with you. It gets bigger and bigger that's every what you year. Want. That is, that is. Um, I talked to Tom earlier and he's going to email me his presentation. As soon as he does that, I'll get it out to you all uh, in the next day or so. Uh, next week is going to be Mr. Josh Jackson. And he's going to be talking to us about machinery for hay production. Uh, if there is no more questions, I don't think I missed any, did I, Tad or April? Um, if there is no more questions, then uh, we will end it for tonight, and I will see you all next Monday. Thanks, and, and y'all be safe, and have a great day. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Very good. Well, you take care up there and stay dry and um, let us know if we can do anything to help.